So when you say it's working, and your book is is very balanced uh, in terms of the positive impacts, but also the more dire impacts, and we can maybe jump to those because you've alluded to the the uh, multimodality. So the risk of disinformation, of uh, misinformation, the risk of cyber cyber attacks. The, we can think of more nefarious uses also um, of AI as uh, creating pathogens and disseminating pathogens and so on. How worried are you about the more negative effects? And we'll get to the positive. I'm, I'm very worried about it, and I think it's right to be concerned. I, th I think that the better framing is rather than assuming that we're going to be stuck with the issues of bias or the issues of hallucinations you know, for the next, you know, decade, assume that those issues are going to be dealt with very soon. And probably in the next two years, I think we're going to largely eliminate hallucinations entirely. Um, and I think that the models are going to get so controllable that they will have a bias to the extent that you, um, you know, shape the model to have the bias. I mean, they're going to have very few unintended biases. I mean, we're already seeing that. If you, this is worth remembering that each generation of these models is 10 times larger in terms of computational consumption than the previous model. So when we talk about going from a, you know, frontier model of generation two, like a GPT-2 or a GPT-3, GPT-4, the difference between three and four is 10x, the difference between two and four is 100x compute. I mean, we, we really haven't, we don't see those curves very often in any area of, of okay. science and engineering. And the fact that we can now predict with very high certainty that over the next five years, models will be trained that are four or five orders of magnitude larger than they currently are today at GPT-4, you know, 10,000 times or more larger, we can also then extrapolate what capabilities might arise with more computational power. Because the, the role of the computation is essentially to attend to, pay attention to more of the underlying training data with respect to itself. So you have these huge, huge, you know, databases of tokens, trillions of tokens, trillions of words, and the models learn the connections between all of the different words. And if you have a small amount of computation, then the model can only use that computational budget to attend to so many of the possible relations between all the different words. If you have essentially infinite, then in theory, it can attend to all, it can make an all-to-all mm -hmm. -all connection between all of the underlying training data. And what we saw in GBT2 was a model that was essentially incoherent, right? It, it was, you know, it could barely complete sentences. It's like unrecognizable. And now with GBT4, it's approaching human level performance at language generation across a wide range of tasks. And it's, it's not just the accuracy that has increased, it's the controllability. So with GBT4, even compared to GBT3.5, it's much easier to provide a specific set of instructions and see a specific set of generations more closely align with that behavior policy. You know, at Inflection, my new company, um, our first model, Inflection 1, um, beats GBT 3.5 on all of the academic benchmarks, including Palm, Google's model, and Llama, the open source Facebook model or meta model. Um, by the end of the year, we will have beaten GPT-4 on every benchmark and we'll be the best model in the world, depending on what Google does with its new model. They might publish before us. And what GPT-5 brings next right. spring. <laughs> and GPT-5 will be, you know, we will, we will produce a GPT-5 sometime in the spring, um, in, basically being 10x larger than the previous model with our own proprietary modifications to how it performs. <laughs> so... To me, it's quite predictable that the models will get much more accurate and much more controllable. The second sort of big step forward we're likely to make is that instead of producing um, a sort of one-shot answer to a question, like at the moment you have to ask a question to an AI and it gives an answer, and that's called one-shot. Instead, you're going to give it a more abstract goal, you know, like a high-level goal, um, and it's going to go off and produce a string of actions 
that are all consistent with one another over time. And those individual actions might be, you know, produce a piece of text, then go and produce a, um, uh, uh, an image, then go and generate an email, and then send that email along with the text and the image to a human, parse their input, you know, take their feedback, integrate that back into the development, you know, of the text and the image and send again, right? And I think that's quite important because that, what I've abstractly described there is a very fundamental capability that all of us use in our everyday work. And these models are likely to be able to do that in the next two orders of magnitude, let's say. I mean, could be more aggressive, but roughly on that order. But it's interesting. I mean, you speak about that and you speak about the spring, but we in the U.S. in the fall will be um, in an election, well, all of next year, but culminating in the fall in an election period. And there is quite a bit of anxiety as to how these models might be used or misused in terms of influencing um, political information. Are you worried about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it is going to be possible to very cheaply produce. And I think the cost is the other consideration, okay. is that, the, you know, as we've seen with the history of all of our technologies, as long as humans have been alive, if it's valuable, then it gets cheaper because everybody wants access and we find more efficient ways of doing it. Um, and so we should expect these AI models to be available in open source, um, almost at the cutting edge of frontier performance, maybe a, a couple of years behind the absolute frontier, and everybody will be able to get access, as we've seen with the um, open source diffusion models for image generation. It's quite an incredible thought. I mean, every image that is available on the open web has now been compressed into a two gigabyte file right. that you can download and run on a you know, good Mac, right? A good laptop. Mm -hmm. And it can generate, you know, novel images that you've never seen before. It, that's, that's really quite remarkable. And that's kind of what I mean by the plummeting cost of power. Because if that trajectory holds, and obviously I'm predicting that it is, then it won't just be the ability to generate images. It will be the ability to generate sequences of actions over time that will be compressed into a very small transferable unit of power um, and usable by anybody. So the synthetic misinformation thing around the elections, sure, important, we should pay attention to it. But I think that's kind of a bit like the discussion we've been having the last few years around bias and around hallucinations. <laughs> important questions, I, don't get me wrong, I really don't mean to trivialize them. I just think step back and consider the broader context over a five and 10 year period you know, we are really going to have extremely capable, <clears throat> you know, intelligences that are approaching human level performance as amazing project managers, assistants, inventors, you know, kind of scientists, really, certainly entrepreneurs. And I think over a 10 year period, those are going to be cheap and widely available in the open source. And I think that's the that's the structural political question to focus on, because what does it mean that anybody can wield state-like powers? 